Welcome back to Will It Work. I'm Kevin. Today we're looking at the Commodore CDTV. And it's kind of where I'm at in the room right now. It's a little bit hard to get a full shot of this, but it almost looks like something you would find in like a stereo um, configuration, you know, CD player type of thing. Uh, this is the last of the set-top box units that we're going to look at. Uh, it is... Uh, Commodore, boy, I don't know. This was probably a big mistake on their part to release this thing the way it was. Uh, the company made a lot of weird decisions. and One of the weird decisions was uh, they created this and, and uh, they wanted to get in on the set-top box market and uh, that didn't exist. And, I, you know, you can't blame them because a lot of other heavy hitters got into it. Apple, uh, Philips you know, Radio Shack, Slash, Memorex, um, etc. Everybody was uh, trying to get into this market uh, where there was no internet at the time. These CDs were full of information and so, you know, you could put encyclopedias and things on them and they thought people would want to, you know, use the, the TV as the main entertainment space and you could watch movies and things on there. We've been over this. And uh, Commodore wanted a piece of that. What Commodore did is that they took the uh, Amiga 500 computer, which was a largely successful computer uh, that was sort of like a home computer uh, before people had big old IBM desktops and laptops and things. Uh, they had this uh, sort of a you know flat with a keyboard computer, and they built it into this CD case. They gave it a CD-ROM drive, and uh, you know some various features. They have this uh, um, wireless remote control with slash gamepad and uh, you could connect uh, a whole bunch of peripherals to the back. You know, you could connect a, a disk drive to it, printer, modem, uh, etc. What you couldn't do though is connect the actual joysticks to it. Uh, <laughs> they got rid of the joystick port of all things. Let's save money on the joystick port. That's kind of stupid because most of these things you would want to do is play games on them. The one thing the Commodore had that uh, the other set-top box makers didn't have was a huge library of titles that would work uh, if they were written to CD uh, on this unit. Of course, you could just get the disk drive and play those games that way. So they could have had a really good game system here, uh, but they didn't. The other problem with it is, is that um, right when they released it, they... Um, we're going through an operating system change and Amigas were kind of interesting in the sense that their operating system was kind of uh, uh, built on two different things. There was a microchip that you would replace inside the unit itself. And this didn't happen all the time of course. Most of the time you would buy something and it would it would be the, the, the microchip would be the microchip that you would use. But they did this transition where the microchip was 1.3 and they went to like version 2 and uh, you had to, if you wanted to do the more advanced version 2, you had to switch the microchip. There were some other configuration things with different versions of the Amiga where you had to also uh, replace the system, uh, one of the system RAM chips from like half a meg to a full meg. This does come with a full meg of RAM, uh, but um, yeah, just sort of... Um, limited in the sense of that it's still running on the 1.3 uh, kickstart, so to speak. And the original Amiga, the first one, it was called the Amiga 1000, it didn't even have that chip is what I recall. You had to put in the kickstart disk, it would load that into memory, and then you would insert a uh, workbench or a game. Workbench was kind of like how you would imagine Windows to be, but the Amiga predated Windows um, by quite a while. And uh, the Amiga was also um, a multitasking computer before multitasking computers were a thing. So you could do more than one thing at the same time, you know, you, that people take for granted today on Windows, etc. You could uh, be playing a game uh, and having a terminal program open or, you know, taking notes on the side or whatever that you normally do when you're inside Windows. Uh, but, um, you know, you could do all of these things, and even it, it could uh, um, break those things down into different resolutions, which, 
nobody really does any of that today. But uh, yeah, it had all this interesting hardware in order to make that happen. But it, do, it would cause bugs and errors, though, because, you know, a game would be occupying a certain place in memory, and it didn't have protected memory like later operating systems had. And so, you know, games would sometimes collide in the memory space, or utilities, etc., and that would cause the, you know, some crashes to occur. Uh, so, you know, there was always that with these older machines. But on the whole, you know, this whole thing, uh, yeah, it was not a success at all. They did run it for quite a while until they came out with the CD32, which we looked at earlier. And the CD32 was also a failure, and Commodore went to their grave with it. Uh, I don't know why they failed at this and then decided that the CD32 was going to be the answer. It seemed like the answer would have been to make the Amiga 1200 a little bit cheaper, maybe provide a CD drive to the CD owners that already existed, and build the Amiga 1200 as a games machine. Uh, why not? And and see how that goes, uh, rather than trying to do it with the uh, CD32, which, uh, yeah, like I said, ended the company. So, um, yeah, let's, uh, I've never used this. I don't know if Fire's going to shoot out the back of it. But here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to plug it in. I'm going to wire it into the video out, assuming it turns on and works. Uh, we'll, um, we'll see if we can get some games working on it, etc. And uh, if not, then we'll come right back here and we'll talk about maybe what's wrong with it and what we're going to do with it. Okay, here we go. Okay, here we are looking at the CD TV. i got to tell you, sometimes I turn these things on. I've been sitting on these things for over 20 years, 30 years, sometimes 40 years and uh or close to i wasn't buying these things when i was 10 um but 30 years let's say and but the systems can be very old and i tell you i i'm impressed sometimes i just turn these things on and they work it just freaks me out well of course we haven't actually tried the cd itself yet but we can see right here the display that they're giving us you know and they're using what they call a hold and modify mode the amiga could um and uh, display 4096 colors on screen at once and if you did it just right it would almost look like a photo uh, using the hold and modify mode um, but uh, you know if you look closer you can see that it's um, it doesn't have the right kind of shading for a full color display so I've got some games now I have one official game that's you know released for the CD2 TV called Team Yankee and then I also found an archive of games online so we're going to go ahead and first we'll try Team Yankee to see if it works. And then we'll uh, put some uh, CDRs in here and uh, we'll see if some of the games work um, in it as well. But first we'll find out if we can get at least one game working. So let's go ahead and pop that in. I also need to make sure that the remote works uh, with the gameplay. Well, it does register and it does see it. Boy, I've been lucky with these CDs. I tell you. Considering the age, you just think the rubber bands and belts would break. But um, it looks like this one's going to go okay. Uh, let's wait and see, though. Empire Presents. Now, a lot of times what would end up happening is, is that uh, game companies that wanted to release a game on the CD TV would just take a game from the Amiga 500 that would be on like one floppy disk or more, but you know, and just put it right on the CD. So it'd be like a one, a one megabyte game would be on like a, a CD it'd be like a total waste, but uh, that's what they would do. So they could get, you know, some market share off of anybody that bought a CD TV can't complain too much about it. I mean, because you know, it would have been nicer if they would have added some video and things because this could do CD XL video it was actually made originally for this system. Uh, but um, uh, a lot of times they didn't enhance the games at all. One game, uh, uh, Defender of the Crown 2, I believe, was um, enhanced specifically for the CD TV, and I'll have to see if I have that, and if I do, we'll look at that, because that's the one game that's actually uh, supposedly, you know, uh, built up around this. Now, it wouldn't be unique, because Commodore did eventually come out with a... Um, CD unit for the Amiga 500, and that allowed you to do everything that was on the CD TV anyway. All right, good. So it goes down, and it goes to the left. 
in the right. All right, looks like the gamepad is working. I wouldn't say it's the best thing in the world. You got to push kind of firmly on it, and it doesn't always get it. But considering the age, I guess it's okay. It'd be nicer if it supported, you know, a regular joystick. But for the purpose of this show, being that we want to know if things work. Early today, Soviet first echelon troops crossed the East German border and engaged NATO forces in strength. This is going to be a good game for us. This is going to be some strategy game. The good news is that our cavalry brought that echelon to a standstill and badly weakened it. The bad news is that they have committed their second echelon to the attack and all of our frontline forces have taken a beating. Uh huh. So this is a mouse game. And you can connect a mouse to this, uh, an Amiga mouse, which I do have, but... Um, I don't think we're really going to be trying to play this uh, too much. Uh, what else can we do here? Evacuation. Click on the top left corner, press enter to start battle. Okay, I don't, I don't really have an enter because I don't have a keyboard. You can connect the keyboard as well. Uh, let's just see what the battle looks like. So I have, like, some reticle in Unit 3. What do I do? I just fired shit that is in my camera view? Is that what we're doing? <laughs> Change modes or something? Yeah, I can blow shit up depending on which camera I'm looking through. Uh, can I move the camera? Can I pan it around? Yes. Where'd that burning tank go? Who's that guy? Shoot that guy. Get that guy. Mmm, fire a missile. Yeah, I got I got nothing. What else we got? Let's go down here. What is it? What is this? Is this Send a tank out or something. Oh, there's a guy over here. This guy don't. It's lighting up. Can't even see. It's just like some dots. Can I drive or something? I can kind of do that. Yeah. So anyway, this kind of gives you a good example, though, of like, a bad game released for this because it's obviously designed for a mouse and a keyboard. It wasn't really designed for this controller and, and this kind of a, a, a playing style. And, but you know, they just released it uh, anyway, you know? So, I mean, it's, it just takes away from the whole set top box experience that this was trying to go for. And, um, uh, you know, I probably blame Commodore uh, on one hand. Hey, more games is better. I don't disagree. Uh, on the other hand, it's kind of like um, they probably should have had some first-run titles that uh, they had sort of made specifically for this system and in order to showcase it a little bit better and what it could do uh, versus, um, you know, just letting anybody throw anything together uh, onto it. All right, let's try uh, some of the CDRs then and see what uh, works and what doesn't, and um, we'll kind of go from there. Okay, so one thing I'm trying to do here is I've gone ahead and connected the Amiga disk drive that I have uh, that was part of my breakout kit on the CD32 that we looked at earlier in this series. And we never really used the disk drive in that series because I didn't really uh, explore the floppy disk aspect of plenty of game CDs. But here, I actually do have a game called uh, Heart of China. That was released by Dynamics um, some time ago, and uh, I believe it is uh, compatible with this system. I'm not sure, but I think it is. It would work on a standard Amiga 500 with the OS 1.3, and uh, it looks like it's going to work. Uh, so this is in the days of floppy disks. Uh, you know, it's very computer-like because we're using a disk drive, so it will. Uh, 
load all of the information off of the disk and then ask you to insert the next one, etc. And it's not installing it on a hard drive because there is no hard drive to put this on. It's loading the game into memory. Now, the system itself has, um, you know, one megabyte of, of RAM. And so my guess is this is the first disk probably loaded the main game engine and the second disk has, um, you know, game elements and files that it needs to uh, continue the adventure, let's say. Uh, <clears throat> now, it will be interesting. I also have the mouse. I'm not sure, though, if I can use this mouse. I'm thinking I cannot because the it's a 9-pin, um, much like the uh, Atari joystick port, which this does not have. So Heart of China was designed for a mouse, and if I had a adapter, which, you know, turned it into a serial mouse type of thing, or maybe I have a serial mouse, maybe it uses a PS2 type mouse, I'm not sure, but it doesn't use the 9 pin. Uh, we're not going to try that, but I'll try is using the controller. Now, this particular game is, uh, gosh, I can't hear me, this is so loud, I apologize, I didn't realize the volume was up that loud. Sorry about that. I didn't know the volume was up that loud. Uh, this particular game was, uh, it's just an adventure game, but it has some arcade elements in it. And it was one of the ones that um, they developed uh, where it had um, branching uh, storyline based on the options that you would pick. So uh, fairly um, novel at the time. You see that with a lot of uh, adventure games today and, you know, Bioware type stuff, and everything. All right, we don't need the credits, though. Let's, can we get past that? Uh, um, let's see the introduction, I guess. Now, this won't be playing like a full motion video segment because this is off a of floppy disk. It may show us some kind of animation, but it's not going to show us like a video off of the, off the disk. It may not show us anything. I'm not sure what the introduction is. Yep, here we go. Now, I never played this game back in the day. Um, it's a bigger game. It had a budget. I wasn't too into adventure games back then. As I've gotten older, I've, I appreciate good adventure games. There's plenty of bad adventure games, but I appreciate a good one. Actually impressed that this booted right up onto the floppy disk. 1.3 operating system with like the Amiga 1000, you first had to put in a kickstart disk. Uh, and here you don't have to do that, you know, nor is it asking for a workbench or anything. So that's kind of cool. It, this game gives a good eye, you know, a good view of um, the capabilities of the, the, what the Amiga was capable of in terms of graphic power. Uh, when this came out in um, the late 80s. Uh, you know, this is predates PlayStation by quite a bit uh, and um, would have been competing against uh, Genesis and uh, Super Nintendo um, to some extent. It became a little later. It depends on where you are. If you're in Japan, it's hard to remember exactly when this launched. I mean, the 1.3, the Amiga, forget exactly when it came out, 86 or something, like, you know, but that was like the 1,000, and then the 500 didn't come out until some time later. And the 1,000 was too expensive and limited. When they finally came out with the more consumer-friendly 500, that was a big success. Social revolution, the world events hardly touched Lucky and Jake Masters as he started, stared blankly at the waters of Hong Kong Harbor. I hate this font. 
He was also a relic. The Great War air raids once soared heroically over Europe. Now his airborne import flew paper parasails and silk dressing gowns out of the interior. Of course, revolution didn't matter now. This morning, Lucky had fallen prey to the most threatening conqueror of all, big business. Oh boy, that sounds thrilling. International business tycoon and profiteer Eugene Adolphus Lomax III decided that Lucky was the flyboy to spirit his kidnapped daughter out of the interior. Lucky had the guts, Lucky had the piloting skill, Lucky owned the planes, and now EA Lomax owned Lucky. This morning, Lomax met Lucky at the dock and sneered that he now held the bank loan on airborne import. To prove his power, Lomax ordered his goon, Quan, to lob a grenade and destroy Lucky's sampan. Suspiciously, the big-time smuggler also knew that Lucky's partner and secretary had skipped town yesterday with all the cash assets. Without money for the loan, airborne import was lost. Oh, no, Lucky, what are you going to do? Guess you'll just have to go save it. All right, let's get past this, man. This, is, this sucks. No one wants to I didn't put this in to read, guys. I didn't play video games to read. I can read a book. Insert disc three. Wow. Sure didn't have a lot of content on disc freaking two, huh? That kind of goes to show you the uh, that little animation we saw for the introduction. That probably took up all the space on the disc. It's just kind of how it was with the music. And these, di these discs only held about 880K, I think. Like the IBM PC at that time... Uh, their um, their discs held 720k, and I believe Apple and Commodore Amiga held 880k. It's just the way it was formatted. I'm not sure why IBM's used less. <clears throat> Maybe you know they were more durable. I have no idea. Okay, there's a bird. Do I pet the bird? Hello, bird. No. What do I do, guys? Okay, I got a gun, some money, and a lighter. We could shoot the bird. That's probably not going to go over well. Can I pet the bird? I really want a bird, looks like. Oh, he just shit. I pick that feather up. Okay, I'm sorry. I thought it was something valuable. I can make gunpowder out of seagull shit. Though made in Hong Kong, the wooden dock is surprisingly sturdy and finely crafted. The salt water, however, has worn the surface to a lacquery slickness. The debris of some poor sop sampan bobs at the Azure waters of Hong Kong Harbor. That poor sap is you, EA Lomax is playing hardball. Guess you better rescue his daughter. I would, man. What if I could figure out how to get out of here?
I'm giving anything to the bird. What's this box over here? Along the waterfront, the influence of British rule in sterling is evident. Hong Kong is being built into a national capital for commerce and banking. Yep. It's great. Fuck do I go. Like, isn't there supposed to be like something that like, well, there's exit. Let's do that. I just exit the game. Go. Just go to the airport. Let's get out of here. It's thrilling shit. I mean, could be, uh, Playing Halo or something, but no. We're gonna insert disc nine. Alright, we'll see what's on disc nine, and then we'll stop. <laughs> Just wanna see if we can get to like an action part of this or something. <clears throat> it's also fun to see how far we've come with video games. And what you have to do to play them. <clears throat> parents would wonder I can't believe my son he spends hours a day playing games well yeah so now we're branching off to the pilot branch this is the different story arcs that you could take could have went to Lomax's I could have went to town instead I chose to get on the airplane I'm not picking up that grappling hook and that rope. Nope. Don't care. Just want to get in the plane and fly. I don't want to hear that piccolo or whatever it is I'm hearing in the background right now. It's killing me. Pan flute. Zomfear. Dying. Dying over here. Let's go to Chen Chen Gao. We're not gonna find his daughter hanging out in Hong Kong. You gotta get into the interior, pick her up, and get out. That was the so we could save the airline. Hundred eighty thousand dollars. That's how much it took to fly there. It was very expensive. I would have went commercial if I knew it was going to cost that much to fly. Damn, where should I land? All these sites kind of look the same. Do, do I have to point out where to land, dude? Just land here. Yeah. All right, we're done playing this one, uh, but um, cool that the disk drive works. Let's um, take a look at one more game on the CD TV, and what I have is Defender of the Crown that was apparently made for uh, this system specifically, and I tell you, there weren't a lot of there weren't a lot of um, games made for uh, the CD TV in general. There were a lot of discs that you could use on it, I suppose, because it is kind of a computer, and and you could you know maybe get some Amiga 500 games on it. But in terms of games that were like specific to this system, not many. 
Some of them will work on the uh, CD32 directly. See, it says CDTV at the bottom. And for reasons I can't explain, the load times on this are weird. Like, like you think you could just skip past this, but it's, I don't know what it's doing. It's still loading or something. I remember playing Defender of the Crown the first time on the Commodore 64. Uh, it was pirated. We downloaded it about the day or the day after it was cracked and released, it was by uh, Eaglesoft Incorporated. That is Eagle on it. And they were kind of in a bit of a war with this other cracking group called um, United Cracking Forces with JJ the Breaker. And EA had a message on the bottom of their intro screen. It said something like, this proves it, JJ. Something like they were kind of giving him a shout out that they got Defender of the Crown before him. Uh, let's try Cedric of... Rather, this is the first time I've ever heard this game with dialogue. These Normans will know the taste of fine Saxon steel. I used to always try to play Wolfric the Wild, and now I'd always lose. Arriving in Sherwood Forest, you are greeted by your old friend Robin of Loxley. They actually made a version of this game for the television. Recently, and uh, looks pretty good. It doesn't look this good, but it looks pretty good for an Intellivision game. It has all the elements of this game in it. it has the jousting, has the raids, has the conquest, has the makeout scene. It's um, quite an achievement that they put that together for the Intellivision. Robin tells you the struggle ahead is for younger men. Men like you, he says. Only you can save England. Robin urges you to raise an army and pledges his aid three times if you will seek to reunite the darkness of the king. When I first played this, I was always like, I don't want to bother Robin, so I'll only use him if I really need him. But in reality, what you should always do is, like in the like your first three turns, you should just ask Robin for help. Because you're going to need him uh, for those first three turns if you want to progress in the game. That's my opinion. This is another game, though. It just kind of gives you an idea of uh, the... Um... So let's, uh, let's look at... Um... Let's hold a tournament. We're not trying to win here. I just want to show you guys the, uh, the graphics and, and a couple of the modes here. And then, you know, we'll wrap it up. So this will be jousting, which I've never been good at. Considering this needs a mouse, I think I probably won't be good at it here either. against Wolfric the Wild because we know he's kind of terrible at everything. And these long pauses, it's just loading. I think this is a one speed CD around one time, so it's really slow. Although the game should be really small, it's still it's got a seek and stuff, and it's it's slow. 
Trying to get my ass kicked jousting like I always do. I have played this game on a lot of different a lot of different platforms. This game's been ported to everything. And I lost. Ah, thus ends your day in the lists of Ashby. You were not champion, but your deeds will be remembered. Leaving for home, you vow to bring glory to you. I can't remember, but I think... I don't remember if it was just in the base game or something else, but I remember there was like... Or maybe it was in like Defender of the Crown 2 or something. I, I sort of remember there being a... Um, other kinds of combat like you know sword fighting or hitting each other with a mace and a shield or something maybe it wasn't this game can't remember see now i kind of got a more grim look on my face because i'm less happy because i had a loss um let's also go raiding that'll be the last thing i show you guys the kind of quest part's just taking your army and going to uh <clears throat> gonna ask Robin for help really you should only if you're playing this game for real my advice is only use Robin when you're doing conquest because you can use his men leadership but eh, you want him you want a little bit of help raiding the castle for some fun why not Yeah, and then you can lay siege to a castle when you get close enough to it and you attack it. And then you have to use like a catapult to knock the walls down. Now, see, normally, if you play this game and Robin Hood joins you, one of those guys should be wearing green. So that that wasn't right. Like in terms of porting this, they didn't do that part. Because one of the guys would be Robin Hood helping you out. Hey, I'm stuck. What the hell? That's bullshit. You should show me the gold. That was kind of a bullshit thing. All right. So overall, that's the CD TV. You know, at this point in time, I believe 90% of these titles would work on a CD32. And, of course, you can emulate an Amiga. You play all of these games a lot easier than you could having an old system like this. Uh, it was novel for its time. It had some weird features with the gen lock and uh, this weird remote mouse. And the fact that it could, you know, use the disk drive and connect the printer to it and do all of these computer-like things. I think, you know, even more than the Pippin, uh, which, you know, is basically a, a Mac, but more closed. There were less expansion choices with the Pippin, where here you could literally turn this into a full-fledged computer. I just think Commodore made a mistake when they lost the uh, joystick ports, which were very important to the Amiga itself. It's funny because they added every other port imaginable, except those. Uh, but overall, you know, the wireless controller, I guess, works okay. I'm sure if it was new, it would work even better. Uh, might have helped if they had a double-speed drive, but it is very quiet. Uh, it's probably one of the better-looking uh, Amigas or consoles in general, just because it's this black sort of 
um, set top thing that would look nice in an entertainment center. But uh, overall, it wasn't a success. It was a failure. It didn't sell any, hardly anything. And um, uh, the CDI outsold it uh, quite a bit. But hey, it still works. It's a keeper. It's part of the collection. Don't really consider it a game system, but I will say of all the set-top boxes we looked at, Memorex VIS, Apple Pippin, CDI, this one has the most games, and uh, at least the control pad, you know, came with an AB button and a, uh, a digital controller. It seemed like they wanted to, you to do that rather than the trackball on the Pippin or that weird sort of analog stick on the CDI. So, uh, Commodore kind of new. If you were going to buy this, you were probably going to play games on it. Thanks for watching. Let's see what we've got for tomorrow. Hopefully something a little bit more exciting, but you never know.